So uh, it's uh, great to have you all here so that we can uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fill in the verb, uh, Sid. Um, it's uh, really in keeping with the sense of collegiality and, and, and good humor that he has brought. We hope. <laughs> Good humor with an edge <laughs> that, 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 that he's brought to the hallway of Rhodes and will continue to do for years to come. And uh, it's great to have this opportunity to uh, celebrate him and use his 70th birthday as an excuse. Uh, but uh, so a number of people would like to make comments. I'm saving mine more for towards the end. But I thought I'd start by reading a few things that were emailed to me from a variety of people. So, uh, Bikramat Das writes, Dear Sid, I wish you a very, very happy 70th birthday. It was an honor to have you as my academic advisor and mentor. I remember all the career advice that came in the form of a joke. The almost illegible scribbles on paper that I collected after our, our hour-long discussions of research, which I only understood because my own handwriting was worse. <laughs> All the rich discussions on research, and of course the fun mo moments when we laughed together. My Cornell days working with you could not have been better. I miss those days. The warmth and care with which you mentored me has shaped the person I am today, and I am grateful for that. All my anticipations about working with the famous and intimidating Sid Resnick melted away the moment we started working together, and it always felt like working with an incredibly wise friend. I wish you always remain that way. I will I always remember you forever young in spirit and never weighed down by all the wisdom. Uh, Yuri Zinchenko writes, Dear Sid, you are one of the biggest humanitarians I met at Cornell. Two conversations I had had profound and positive consequences. At least I think they're positive. What? <laughs> <laughs> One was an offer to count the number of national labs with employment prospects. At the time, I was over naive in thinking finding a job like that is feasible, an illusion stripped away by simple counting. <laughs> Another was a more private and partly, and partly revolved around the notion of knighthood, which only Sid could bring up. The latter talk helped me to Sir. keep... The latter talk helped me to keep focus and complete my degree. Always, I am not sure you even remember these, Sid. I wanted to thank you. <coughs> Happy seven, 70th and he's a little bit out of touch, and hope you still play basketball. <laughs> those days are gone. Yeah, those days are gone. That was too sport to go. Yeah. <laughs> Ganesh, Janakiram, mom. I can't say this. Okay, anyway. Nailed it. Okay, good. Happy birthday to you. I finally remem remember two things about you. One, soccer. A bunch of us PhD students used to play soccer periodically in the lawns near the math department and the clock tower. Shane and you, perhaps others too, joined us often. I was used to playing soccer without shoes. For some reason, you were either amused or annoyed by this. I'm still trying to figure out which. <laughs> and gave me a particularly hard time on the field. Nevertheless, your warmth was unmistakable. And come to think of it, you actually played very well. I had no idea you were close to 60 already at that time. I wish I were that energetic when I hit 40, said to happen quite soon. So that was point one. Two, research description. In our first year, faculty members took turns to have week a weekly meeting with us in which an individual faculty member would describe his or her current research to us. You were re researching he heavy tail distributions and internet traffic. To liven things up, you described or conjectured the kind of internet traffic that was entering Rhodes Hall. Needless to say, that was the only research nugget that has survived in my memory from that series of meetings in 98 or 99. Once again, happy birth to, birthday to you. Please continue infusing the hallways of Cornell ORIE with your enthusiasm and sheer. Best wishes, Ganesh. And finally, amongst the ones that I wanted to read is a bit longer one from a long time old 
acquaint, a colleague, acquaintance, Ed, Ed Ray, who is now the president of Oregon State. Sydney, which really shows the dating of that. that the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the pace is picking up quickly, and my life will be mostly a blur for the next 10 months when in intermittent periods of clearing. So I'm trying to get tasks done before the waves hit, and I definitely want to send some comments along for your roasting. Below are my comments for your roast that I hope someone can read on my behalf. Sydney and Minna are family to me. Both are wonderful. Minna is remarkably approachable and creative, and Sydney is a deep thinker with a delightfully impish quality. Impish is just such a great word. <laughs> Let me describe some early misadventures that foretold the full-blown version of Sidney Resnick that the world has come to know. I got my first car in 1967, and Sidney and I decided to drive to Cape Cod, which somehow ended up in a trip to actually see the end of the island we were inhabiting on, at Montauk Point. When we got there, the fog was so thick we could see nothing. Along the way, we slept in his car and got roused and told to leave by the police in Southampton. I also approached a very stately house the night before that we thought would look like a hotel. I asked the well-dressed man who answered the door if we could rent a room for the night, and he told me the place was a funeral par parlor. <laughs> and no, we could not rent a room. Sidney brought the same intensity to basketball that he does to his research and teaching. One su summer, Sid, our friend Ira, and I went to various city parks to play pickup games of basketball, including once in a pretty tough area of Brownsville. The teams we played did not include any white players, and they were very impressed by Sid's rebounding ability, and less so by his throwing up periodically. <laughs> Sid and I decided to undertake a camping adventure at Palisades Park, which is across the river from Manhattan. We borrowed my Uncle Fred's six-man canvas tent. Unable to figure out how to put up the center pole of the tent, we created two one-person apartments with a sadly sagging middle to the tent. Sydney asked if there were any dangerous animals there, despite the view of the Manhattan skyline across the river. I have no idea what possessed me, but I told him that sometimes raccoons would scavenge for food and that despite the fact that he was sleeping in a sleeping bag on a chaise lounge in a tent on a wooden platform, he should keep his fingers and toes inside a sleeping bag on it in case a raccoon mistook it for a hot dog and bit it. For the next endless hours, Sydney would wake me up regularly asking if I had heard that. I tried to convince him, but failed that there was a whole world out there. Sid and Minna visited for a day this past summer, and Sydney's curiosity about all things electronic and mechanical and inability to manage them persists. <laughs> he managed to reset several stations on my car radio, and my co coffee pot had been reset. <laughs> the day after they left, I realized it was very hot in my car, despite the 65 degree setting on the thermometer. I finally figured out that Sydney had reset the rear area thermostat to 85 degrees. <laughs> so Sydney remains a most interesting and challenging presence. I love you like a brother, Sydney, and I'm very proud of you, Ed. Okay, so, so those were some remote comments of people who couldn't be here. And uh, I think I'll ask Mark Lewis to come up next. And... Uh, <laughs> Get the daggers out. <laughs> so, uh, thanks, David. So yesterday, David, or day before yesterday, David stopped by in my office and said, um, "Do you want to make some comments uh, at Sid's roast?" And you said no. <laughs> I said, "Hell yes." I said, "Are you kidding me?" I said, "How much time do I have?" <laughs> So I want to tell you a few things about Sid. The first thing uh, I will tell you is um, that he's had a profound effect on my career. So what, you, what may, many of you probably already know, I was at the University of Michigan and then thinking about leaving, and um, I called my good friend Shane Henderson, and, and, and he in turn talked to Sid, and Sid said, why don't you, why don't you come to Cornell? So in some sense, um, that started the ball rolling, getting me to come, and then Jim Rangar finished it off, so that was great. Um, so one of the things I want to think about is that for many of us, 
Um, at around the age of 35-ish, Sid had a profound effect. You can think of it as birthing me. So, <laughs> my, Cornell, my Cornell life began with Who Sid. Was mother? And, <laughs> well, one might ask that question, wouldn't they? <laughs> That's, that's, that's part one. Part, part two, I wanted to say um, that, that Sid is an acquired taste. <laughs> and, and by that, I, I, I mean that um, um, if you think about it, you learn how to, how to drink beer when you're younger, and, and maybe warm beer. He's a very warm guy, that you actually get to know him. We had him over the house a few times, and he would berate people that I respected highly, like Mike and, and, and uh, Marina, and I thought, oh, I Wow, he's going after Mike pretty hard. And so the first time he was at the house, I thought it was just me that he was picking up. <laughs> he left, and Wendy said, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> and so um, we realized very quickly that, that he's an acquired taste, but he's very oh, warm. So, sensitive. so he's so sensitive. So if you think about Sid, and think about life in the department with Sid, it's like drinking warm beer. <laughs> okay, an acquired taste. Last thing I wanted to say, I think, I think it's better said if I just explain it um, via a, a short skit that the wife and I have worked on. So I'm going to ask uh, Wendy to come up. And it's, 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 more, it's, it's more reading and response. And, and many of us know how it is to go to Sid's office to skip him. He's the last person you get to go to lunch. Okay? So it happens every, every so often, every several days. Many of the faculty go to lunch together. And we always end up at Sid's, Sid's door last. So the skit is really between, a uh, conversation between Sid and I. So the part by me, I can't play myself, <laughs> is going to be played by Wendy. <laughs> and the part of Sid is going to be played by me. Oh. OK. So keep track. You'll, you'll keep track. Trust me on this. You'll know. <laughs> you'll know, you'll know <laughs> who's <laughs> Sid and <laughs> right. who's me. So here's the, here's the beginning of the skit. Uh, this is me knocking on the door. I'm Sid. Come in. Hey, Sid. It's Mark. Oh, jeez. <laughs> when I say come in, I meant I'm not here. <laughs> I was at least hoping someone better would be coming to my door. Maybe a better Mark, Eichmann, or a better Louis, Adrian. But lo and behold, here you are again, opening my door. What do you want? <laughs> Whatever, man. Do you want to go to lunch? Well, yes, but who else is going? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are a long list of people that I prefer to have lunch with. There's uh, Mike, or David, or David, or, or Shane, or David. Hussein, <laughs> or <Cool>. Satan. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to know who else is coming. Mike and Shane are going. OK. I'll go. Cool. We should go because we have to head back for that faculty meeting. Oh, boy, Mark. You are really lined up my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is going to make you even happier. Um, I'm going to send you an email. We want to have you and Minna over for dinner. Mark, you do realize. And the only reason I come to dinner is because Minna makes me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and that shrimp you make. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So can you make it? Let me be certain I have nothing else more important to do. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, cleaning the bathroom. <laughs> what do you have it? Shrimp. <laughs> Catherine and Victoria and Kevin, come up. <laughs> I can 
see the look of fear in your eyes already yeah. <laughs> when they handed me this mic. Uh, don't worry, uh, my four-year-old son uh, is here in, te- in attendance, uh, so I'll show some restraint, not too much. Uh, I was a graduate student here uh, 20 years ago with uh, Victoria and uh, Kathy uh, when Sid turned uh, 50. Uh, I really, uh, quite a bit has changed in this department uh, since then, uh, but I see uh, quite a few familiar faces uh, and one familiar hairstyle. <laughs> when I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> When I was invited to uh, this event, my first reaction was, I didn't realize he was still teaching here. (laughs) I wasn't even sure he was still ambulatory. (laughs) Then I wondered, why was the department holding a roast in Sid's honor? Roasts are usually reserved for people that are universally beloved. (laughs) (laughs) You don't know that word, yeah. I hear that Sid has taken up uh, cycling as a sport, and that's uh, really wonderful news. Uh, I was lucky to play uh, with soccer uh, in the Saturday games at uh, Cass Park, and he possessed a uh, a really youthful uh, exuberance uh, for the game. On the field, you could easily mistake him for uh, Lionel Messi. (laughs) Except for his athleticism, (laughs) decision-making, technique coordination, uh, and hairstyle. They say that the sign of a good teacher is if students can remember uh, three big ideas from uh, a course 20 years later. So here I am 20 years later, and let's see. What do I remember? I remember uh, a basketball playing, binge drinking, delusional restaurateur named Happy Harry, (laughs) Uh, who spent most of his day fumigating uh, uh, the kitchen, and patrolling the bathroom for uh, drugs, and, <laughs> and creeping on a, uh, let me get the exact phrase, uh, comely young lady. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, uh, in all uh, sincerity, there are not many people that I would drive uh, four hours uh, to insult. With a four year old. That's only reserved for uh, close friends uh, and extended family, and Sid, I consider you both. Uh, so happy birthday, congratulations. Uh oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, it's changed. You don't like the mm. you That's your retirement your home. <laughs> <laughs> Are you dating me your summer home? <clears throat> It's really short, I promise. <laughs> not the memories, the presentation. Not, not the memories, the presentation, absolutely. So. How are people take care of the memories? <laughs> <laughs> we will indeed. So, so one thing that, uh, that Kevin forgot to mention is that Sid is actually a really big reason that all three of us were PhD students here. Now, you'll, all of us were the PhD, we call ourselves the PhD class of 1993. Now, undergraduates tend to <laughs> date themselves by the date when they leave an institution, but there's no such fixed point for PhD students. So we have to go to the beginning, when we, the only fixed point we have when we actually walk in the door. And that was 1993 for the three of us. So Sid was a very, engaged and active part of the recruiting process. He was what was called the GFR back then, um, the graduate field representative, which is actually just the the precursor and the less sexy acronym to today's DGS, or the Director of Graduate Studies. Sid took this job with with great relish and passion to the point that we'd be getting phone calls like at nine o'clock on Sunday night, answering it. Hi, Sid Resnick from Cornell. What? So, as you know, a 23 year old, we're kind of wondering who's this guy calling us at 9 o'clock on Sunday night? Nevertheless, he did a fantastic recruiting job, and in the three of us came. So, all, all we can say, Sid, is you know, it's, it's really your fault. That we're here. <laughs> 
So some of the, the things I'd just like to, to really briefly uh, uh, mention tonight is that we had the great fortune of being students here during an extraordinary period of time. So when we came in, 1993, I believe that this was the year that, that Sid was actually turning 48. Um, and, and I should mention that the events that ensued over the course of the next five years while we were here, we were just so lucky to be able to be a part of as complete observers. And despite the fact that insinuations have been made over the years that we were actually involved in said events, I, 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 I say to you all now that really this is purely coincidental. <laughs> and in any event, really, uh, there's no proof. So that year, actually, October 27th, 1993, the first extraordinary event was that, like Charlie Brown, um, the great pumpkin actually decided to pay a visit to Sid's office that year <laughs> in the form of roughly a 100 pound pumpkin, uh, which was obviously captured uh, uh, captured on film, and, and just so you understand, <laughs> Sid, I think, did at the time and has still come to regret that this photo was ever, <laughs> ever taken. Okay. Yeah. Nevertheless, um, it, it, was, it was an enjoyable year for us all into our first year. We couldn't help but notice, as we were looking at this amazing photo, just a beautiful sh shape of the head. I mean, it almost you know, looked kind of like a balloon. <laughs> and it also vaguely resembled one of Sid's favorite vegetables, which of course is a Brussels sprout. <laughs> and, and somehow this knowledge got out among the general public. So the following year, um, uh, we came to the office and were so surprised <laughs> to see Sid's, o Sid's office. No, this is not really. This is a little bit of an artist rendition. However, uh, Sid's office was somehow amazingly filled with balloons that day. And we enjoyed him particularly after a few hours when he came in to teach because his voice was squeaking like this. <laughs> the, picture. the helium in, in the office was really um, quite transcendental. Throughout the course of the day, uh, he also, I, I believe, received gifts of, of, of Brussels sprouts. Not just once, but periodically throughout the day, small gifts would be delivered during lecture, during basketball games, at various other inconvenient times. The I remember fame, not getting much work done. <laughs> The fame of Sid continued to grow. This was his 49th birthday. So coming into uh, his 50th year, the idea of the vegetable grew. And in fact, 50 gourds somehow ended up again, once again, in his office that day, along with lots of wonderful pictures. <laughs> of the local media, and in fact, a national syndication uh, decided they really, really liked this pose. They really enjoyed uh, the image that was Sid. So moving into his 51st year, which, <laughs> which was in fact one card short of a deck in many ways, the Hoyle Card Company decided this is fantastic. It's Sid's 51st year, one card short of a deck. We are, in fact, going to release a new version of playing cards in Sid's honor. And several of these cards actually showed up <laughs> around the department that year. Perhaps this actually led to his love of bicycles. <laughs> As Get to the tissues. <laughs> tissues? Tissues. Tissues? That wasn't us. <laughs> that wasn't us. This 
wasn't us either. As his fame grew, actually national and international syndicates picked up on this. So coming into 1997, some of you may remember the Martin Hanford, Where's Waldo? Where Waldo would periodically pop up at times. And of course, you would have to look for Waldo in very complex pictures of, of different individuals. So in honor of Sid's uh, 52nd birthday, they actually came out with a new rendition. <laughs> Which was widely distributed on cereal boxes throughout Ithaca and actually throughout the United States. So we were, again, very blessed uh, to be witness to all of these events. And as we actually, Victoria had had left Cornell at that point, already gone to Wall Street, so, so you certainly can't blame her for this. <laughs> and as we were leaving, it was almost as if there was you know, fate's hand saying goodbye to us here. As many of you may remember, in 1997, there was the real <coughs> great pumpkin here at Cornell. In fact, on October 27, 1997, a New York Times article appeared in which the discussion of the amazing pumpkin, which many of you may remember, appeared atop the clock tower in 1997, and to this day is still a mystery. How did enormous pumpkin end up atop Cornell's 170 three foot tall bell tower. Now, all I can say is the fact that this is published on Sid's birthday. <laughs> Unclear. What we can say, Sid, is that it's been a long time. You've come a long way. You'll always still be our Superman. <laughs> And we want to say congratulations from all of us. I want to add um, two things. So, Catherine and Cam, they already talked about how we became a PhD students, you know, thanks in part to uh, Sid. Um, my mother still has a letter that Sid wrote after I was admitted into the PhD program and before I formally accepted. He wrote a letter to me. So I lived in Brooklyn at that time, went to NYU, was graduating from there. Sid was worried that I would not want to leave my family in New York and you know, be separated by 200 or something miles. So he actually took time to make cutouts from Cornell Daily Sun with a bus schedule. And uh, listen, that was before you know, Cornell bus. They were just ad hoc buses, short line, right, and Greyhound. He actually made time to cut out, and he wrote a letter in red pen that my mother still has. Could you read it? <laughs> yeah. um, um, that basically says, Victoria, we're happy, something along the lines, Victoria, we're happy that you were admitted. We hope you can come. And I just want to let you know that New York City is closer than you think to Ithaca. And my mother said to me, this is uh, your lesson number one. If somebody really wants you this much, go there. Um, so thank you for that. Now, my, fir my other uh, vivid memory of Sid, and it actually kind of makes sense that this event is held at the uh, Art Museum, is I remember Sid was always very passionate about arts and uh, very much uh, engagingly talking about uh, Mina's uh, art. And in particular, I remember on many occasions in painful detail describing how he had to put her printing press <laughs> in the basement of the house. He still talks about that. <laughs> see, see what I mean? We, we've listened to that on numerous occasions in a lot of detail. So, um, but we do appreciate your art. I took some, I, I went online and I saw it, it's beautiful. So obviously your efforts were not wasted either. Um, with this, I would like to present you with this poster. That signifies almost everything except for the art. I had no idea how to stick the printing press on this. Um, but so this is Sid modifying the front cover of the infamous Happy Harry book by adding a bicycle 
where he's basically on a collision with what we presume is Happy Harry running up the hill. They could and now that to the, the movie Trainer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that works. And uh, of course, this is uh, the random walk of Happy Sid. And it's signed by Kevin, Catherine, me, and also Jim Rapold in absentia, who wishes you the best, but could not be here, could not travel from Florida today. So we love you. Thank you. <laughs> so next, if uh, Richard Davis could come up and say a few words. Okay. Sid, can you hear me? No. Speak up. It's a tough act to tough act uh, to to follow. Um, hey, this is Cornell, baby. <laughs> right to um, so so I've, I've come here to to tow Sid. As, as Sid knows, it's not my makeup to roast anybody, especially old people. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Sid. <laughs> so Sid, Sid ha has had a huge impact on my life, both, both professionally and, and, and personally. In fact, aside from my parents, maybe my brothers, my family, colleagues I've had, Colorado State, Columbia, neighbors. Homeless <laughs> <laughs> people. <laughs> it's hard to imagine anyone having a bigger impact than, than, than Sid. <laughs> he played an important role in me getting a job at both Colorado State a long time ago. And more recently, he had some role, I suppose, in me getting a job at Columbia. But I really want to focus on, on the personal side. When Patty, this is my, my wife. Here it comes. <laughs> yeah, this was broadcast easily. But my wife and I moved to Colorado. We weren't married at the time. And we spent a lot of time with the Resnicks, and we spent a lot of time skiing with, with Sid and Rachel. So it would be the four of us, Sid, Rachel, Patty, and myself. And it was about a two hour plus drive up to the ski area. And spending a couple hours with Sid both ways in the car was an experience on its own, but I don't want to focus on that aspect. <clears throat> it was riding the chair with Sid. And I usually ended up riding a chair with Sid. There's a two-person chair, and Patty and Rachel. Rachel, you remember this, right? Uh, Patty rode up with Sid, with uh, with Rachel, and just watching Sid get on a chairlift, you know, these two long sticks on his feet. He did. He wasn't completely coordinated in, in managing that, and, and the poles and the whole thing. But which he was safely ensconced on the chair. Um, it was always the same conversation. And it went like something like this. Why don't you marry her? <laughs> and it, it was a long chair to ride. And it was 10 minutes, nonstop uh, conversation, one-sided, I might add, about, you know, you really should marry her. You could just uh, discuss all the reasons, all the positive reasons why I should marry Patty. And eventually, I wanted to ride the chair with Rachel. <laughs> So this is back in 1984. I was spending a semester at the Center for Stochastic Processes in Chapel Hill. And I returned for spring break to visit both Patty and, uh, and Sid. And I remember distinctly being at his blackboard going through a proof. And Sid kept interrupting me. And Sid was behind his desk. And he had his little blackboard for which he could only put a baby two epsilons on it. That's it. And Sid said, um, so why don't you marry Patty? <laughs> and um, 
I would turn and look at Sid, and then I would go back to the proof. And he said, and then he said, what would it take for you to marry Patty? <laughs> and so I thought about it. I just gave him an answer, just to kind of shut him up so I could finish this, this argument. I said, well, I need to have tenure. And Sid said, well, you have tenure. <laughs> well, it had to be signed by the State Board of Agriculture. I wanted to make sure it was completely official. And so he said, what else? I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not very good at public speaking. And I'd like to have a really tiny wedding, like just Patty and me and the judge. And he said, well, that's, that doesn't seem fair for Patty. Well, maybe she'd like her family. I said, well, maybe her family could come, but that's it. No uncles, just immediate family. And then he goes on a couple more items. <laughs> she could have any kind of reception she wants. And then we keep discussing this on and on. And I keep going back to the proof. And then finally, I realized he was writing down all these items. <laughs> <laughs> and his, his handwriting has come up already. It was handwritten on, he said use scratch paper. And usually use the back side <laughs> of, of the paper. And he had written out a prenuptial contract. <laughs> and I think this is one of the early prenuptial contracts in history. And it had all the items. It said, item one. I agree to marry Patty. Item one was um, have to have tenure. Item two, um, small wedding, we any reception she wants, and so on. And he had signed it. He had put a space there for, for, me, for my signature, for Patty's signature, and of course, he signed as the witness to <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing, and he gave it to me. And I took it home, gave it to Patty. Pretty romantic. <laughs> <laughs> she signed as well. So there's many takeaways from this story. And I think everyone kind of jumps to the same conclusion. Yes! <laughs> this is proof that Sid has the capacity to be a kind, generous, and thoughtful. <laughs> person. Happy birthday, sir. <laughs>
after I got married to Anke, uh, I had a herniated disc, and you talked to Anke, and you told her, maybe you should check out whether there is a lemon oil in the Netherlands, and maybe you can stay the lemon. I had two classes with Sid, um, and I learned a lot. So I also played soccer with him. <laughs> and his flexibility in mathematics and in normal life is something that will always, you know, stay with me. Look at this flexibility. <laughs> One of the things that I learned in my class and that I actually uh, still use often is what's known as Sid Resnick induction. That is, how do we prove Sid Resnick, Resnick induction? We check the case k equal to 1, we check the case k equal to 2. If they're both true, it's probably true for all k. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mike Todd's version would be k equal to 0 and k equal to 1. And then <laughs> There's actually a second thing that I learned from you in your classes. <laughs> it's actually what I use in my class a lot. So awkward silences. <laughs> They're wonderful. <laughs> um, so I mean, in my classes I usually have an awkward silence until anyone says anything and it works like a charm. Uh, so anyway, um, as, as I've shown you, I've learned two things from you. So by Sidresnik induction, you can say that all the teaching that I've learned is from you. <laughs> <laughs> and I thank you so much for it. <laughs> Thanks. So next, Mike Todd has a few comments to add, assisted by his wife with the cane. No. <laughs> <laughs> so until, uh, until Franz started speaking, I was really worried about this once. Um, I once made my wife, when she had gastroenteritis, a meal of rara ovis, where you take a leg of lamb and you turn on the oven and you wave the lamb at it and then you cut it up and serve it. Um, and it's not too healthy. And it's like eating pork at 90 degrees and so This is not a roast. You have to really kill the, kill all the nasty stuff in there. So, um, so Sid, um, um, some of you may know uh, this great British movie, uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral, where people develop roasts to a, to a pretty high level. Uh, a bunch of friends meeting at a bunch of life-changing situations, and that seems suitable. And roast the hell out of each other. So, um, four weddings and a funeral. Uh, wedding doesn't seem quite appropriate, but there is one story I'd like to bring up, but um, there are children here, and, and Rachel and Nathan, so I won't tell you about Sid and the sheep. <laughs> so, on to the funeral. So, I know two other famous Sids. One I'd forgotten about till uh, earlier, Sid Vicious. But given Sid's behavior towards Moreno, I think it's, it's quite appropriate. This is, uh, I'm not even sure it's a different character at all. Maybe it's uh, just an alter ego. The other one is someone I really admire, Sid Caesar. So here's something that's inspired by Sid Caesar. I come not to praise Sid, but to bury him. Um, actually, sorry, it starts, friends, Ithacans, Ori men. I come not to praise Sid, but to bury him. So, uh, how can I bury him? Um, well, I don't know so much about his research. Um, I think I've listened to him talk a couple of times. Um, didn't understand too much of it. Uh, heavy tail phenomena, I thought they died out 65 million years ago. Uh, extreme values, uh, I'll come back to a little bit. And, you know, I, I've seen his research slow down, and you know, this is the true, true for all of us over 50. You wake up one morning and you think, 
I'm really not going to do anything creative again. But then you say, not so bad, I've got all these young, smart students about. I'll just steal their ideas. So, you know, we've all done it. And Sid has been doing this for a number of years now. Quite, 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 you know, quite strong at it. But I'm afraid I have to bring up one of his collaborations that, you know, this is one of his closest collaborators over so many years, someone who, who worked with Sid and always with a grin. And I hate to share this with you, but I, I have to tell you that after years of abuse, Happy Harry had a nervous breakdown. He's now in therapy and he, he's getting over it. But he said, you, you went too far with Harry. I think it was maybe crashing him into himself too many times. Um, so teaching, we've, we've heard about your, your great teaching, especially from the anonymous uh, Red Mike Professor uh, comment. Um, but the other thing I remember is for, for a large number of years, you, you, you led the school of OR and IE. And you know, we old timers, we, we thought modestly, this is arguably the best OR department in the world. I mean, this was a phrase we used to use to sort of convince ourselves. And we said, OK, how much can Sid screw it up? <laughs> and this is where extreme value theory comes in, right? From here to here. So over the years, sequence of ill-conceived hires, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you had mentioned it. Like, there were a number of people here. <laughs> Disastrous financial decisions. Here we are today with incoherent academic programs, weak students, a dispirited faculty. So I just have to say, Thank you, Sid. <laughs> I hope you're proud of what you did to the department. <laughs> so if you'd all like to raise your glasses, thank you, Sid. I hope you're all as proud as, as we are of what you did to the how you built the department. Shane, how about adding a few more comments as well? Uh, oh, yeah! <laughs> oh, I'm going to enjoy this. Try not to do all. <laughs> so I was one of those ill-conceived hires. <laughs> So Sid knows how to boost one's self-esteem. So before I even showed up at this place, I never met the guy. Um, Robin Roundy invites me to a play on the Thursday night while I'm visiting for my interview to, to visit this place, right? And so I get this email from Robin. So I say, yes, please, that sounds great. Because of course, you just accept everything when you're going for an academic interview, right? And then I get this email from Sid. It says, Forget the play. Come and play soccer with us. It'll be much more fun. Don't hang out with that weenie or whatever. Or that guy, that idiot. And, and of course, in, in interview mode, you're thinking, hmm, this is a test. Right? So I'm thinking through, oh my god, what do, I, what do I do here? I mean, this is clearly a test. Right? So what do I say to this guy? So I compose this really long email. Look, that's really great. I do love soccer. I would love to play. But, you know, I, I already said yes to the play. And I actually quite do like place because I was worried he was going to talk to Robin. And, and so I composed this thing and I sent it off and I'm on tenterhooks, right, thinking, Ugh. and he sends me back this one word email, weenie. <laughs> <laughs> this is his hiring strategy. <laughs> now I'm from New Zealand and actually that works pretty well because we like kind of <laughs> cut to the chase. So I knew where I was standing before I even showed up. And then uh, we had many more sort of great moments where he was boosting other people's self-esteem. There was a person we hired and said, you knew this was coming and it's coming back to haunt you. So there's, a, there's an occasion where the faculty introduce, uh, sorry, the department chair introduces new faculty 
to uh, the other people in the College of Engineering. So there's this assembled multitude, and you get up there and you say these very nice things about somebody who's just arrived, and to, to clean it up and sort of polish it off, you offer a, a lovely little tidbit about um, uh, this person, you know, a personal side of things. And, and this particular faculty member, she had arrived, and Sid was introducing her, and she was standing just below him up there, and he goes, and by the way, she has the biggest bike seat I've ever seen. <laughs> Metaphor. <laughs> so, and and when, I, when I asked him when he got back to the uh, sort of the corner, I, you know, I just, bike seat? You know, bike seat? He goes, yes, that was memorable, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so before I get too far along, though, I do want to say, um, Minna, you are a saint. <laughs> yeah. I must say, people give me condolences every time I tell them how many years we've been married. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can see it right here, right? I mean, you kept his feet on the ground, and, and dare I say it, he took us out of the fire, right? <laughs> hey, there was one. Yeah. Did, did I use the right word? It's the right word. Okay, with, good. With an outrageously bad pronunciation. <laughs> no, fantastic. Okay, so <laughs> so you can see that Sid is, has a gift for trash talk, and so I give you two examples. So one was um, he's decided that uh, I can't prove theorems, so he's like, you know, this is this is this is the standard thing. You told me. <laughs> no. <laughs> so he's told me I can't prove theorems. He's actually right. That's what why I have students. And that works well. Um, so he, he does trash talk about you know proving theorems. But the other thing that he trash talks about is soccer. So when we were playing, we tended to be on the same team, but occasionally we would play against each other. And that was quite fun. And so I'd be attacking, he'd be on de defense, and, and he called himself the glove. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so... So I'm playing against the glove, you know, and, and, and so we'd have these sort of battles, and I think I, I don't think I scored past you actually. You know, you, uh, you you kept me kept me scoreless there, but um, the, the the most fun part of the soccer games were actually the post mortems after the games when we'd sit on the bench trying to put our shoes on to go outside <laughs> and not being able to move. Yeah, it took us about half an hour to get out of those places, right? Yeah. At least. So. Um, there's another dimension to Sid, though. I mean, he was supportive at every step of the way. He hired me, and in my very first year, it was uh, 2001, um, so September 11th hit, and so uh, I cancelled class on that day because I could see that it just wasn't going to work. And uh, so Sid came by very shortly afterwards, actually. You may not remember this, but you came by, and you just said, are you okay? Right? And... Uh, so I was, I was fine, but, but I really appreciated that. I think that was another one of these sort of personal dimensions. And, um, you know, at, at various times he's had this really nice touch that has ju just a soft nudge, and I think it was really appropriate. So there was another time we were coming to the end of a pretty busy academic year, and I was pretty white. And we went to this faculty meeting, and I vented at someone who really did not deserve it. I should have kept my mouth shut, but I didn't. And... Sid should have kicked me in the, what is it called? Tux. Tux, right? He should have kicked me there, but he didn't. All he said very, very quietly to me was, maybe you shouldn't have come to that meeting. <laughs> you know, but, but what I liked about that comment was it was a quiet nudge. It wasn't, it wasn't a boot, and, and it really had uh, a deep effect on me. I, I listened very carefully to what he said there. On another note, Sid also introduced me to the delights of quality equipment. <laughs> so Sid, Sid was the owner of a kick-ass bike light for a very long time, and I had this pathetic little candle <laughs> in the front of my bike. And so eventually I did actually get a kick-ass bike light. That was his term, it was kick-ass bike light. And, um, and I'm also very proud to say that after only 14 years, I now have fenders on my bike, uh, which he has been nudging me for for years. But the cell phone... That's going to take a little bit, Sid. There's a bit of work there. So um, it's been a privilege to call myself or to feel like I was one of your colleagues. So that's been a real delight and, uh, and a privilege. I think um, you, uh, like actually Catherine, Victoria, Kevin was saying, 
you were a very important part of, uh, you know, a very big part of the reasons that uh, Ali and I and my family came to came to Cornell, and uh, that that was very very important. I think um, there's some words that I think encapsulate you: excellence, integrity, humility, and bizarre pronouncements. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, if, if we were in New Zealand, uh, I would say something like, uh, Sid, you're, you're a bloody good joker and uh, good on you. But uh, we're not there. So what I'll say instead is, uh, uh, you're a real mensch. And uh, mazel tov. So, Nathan, if you could come up. I don't even know you speak. Uh, maybe Jake to get you to the desktop. Oh no. Yeah. Oh, this is Seriously? I want to get to the desktop because there's down below. Oh, good. There we go. No, no, it's it's we're, we're fine. First, thank you for this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's extraordinarily rare that a son gets the opportunity to stand in front of his father and all of his professional colleagues and their families with the expectation that he will be discussing what a huge goofball his dad is. <laughs> <laughs> Sincerely, thank you. Could you raise the mic so we can hear you better? It's you sound like Richard Davis. <laughs> Second, I hate public speaking. The last night my dad told me that he supposedly gets a lot to have the last word tonight. And if there's anything I hate more than public speaking, it's letting my dad get the last word, <laughs> which is why I prepared a four hour roast. <laughs> I hope everybody's comfortable. Anyways, as many of you know, there's two sides to my father. One side is the more serious side, which is demonstrated by my dad's tremendous work ethic research, teaching, mentoring, writing, and fervent bicycling. <laughs> the other side of my dad is demonstrated by the fact that we are having a roast for his 70th birthday instead of just an honorary dinner or regular party. My dad has a very unique sense of humor, and to clarify, I mean a unique sense of humor for an adult. <laughs> He is basically a Benjamin Button of humor. The older he gets, the younger his sense of humor gets. <laughs> Go ahead, test him. The next time you talk to him, say, pee pee, <laughs> or call him butt face. <laughs> he cracks up every time. Growing up, I did not have too much, uh, I didn't have too much of a sense of my father's professional accomplishments. Sure, while I was in college, he was the director of OR. He advised some of my friends, handed some of my friends their diplomas, kicked a few of my friends out of OR. <laughs> it wasn't until after Cornell that I really understood the widespread impact that my dad, on this, my dad had on the statistics community. When I graduated from Cornell with a fairly useless degree in American studies, I moved to New York and stumbled on a career in tech recruiting. Over the years, I actually spoke professionally to a number of people who knew who my father was, and I remember one conversation very clearly. He exclaimed, he's supposed to be great. I have his book, Adventures in Stochastic Processes, on my shelf, but it's way over my head. He also sounded like he had just met a celebrity and was extremely excited, and I pitied him. <laughs> and then, of course, he followed up with the question, so wait, if Sid Resnick is your dad, what are you doing as a tech recruiter? <laughs> For years, I've been hearing about Happy Harry, his slightly psychotic ex-girlfriend, the streaking of mutant creepazoids, and Happy Harry dreaming that he is a prince charming and saving sleeping beauty only to find out she is sleeping in the fetal position and sucking her thumb, so only attractive to orthodontists. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I have no idea where my dad came up with these situational problems. But naturally, 
I always just assumed that my dad modeled Happy Harry on himself and was into some super weird stuff before he <laughs> <laughs> It has now been over 20 years since Happy Harry was unleashed on the world, and while we are all anxiously awaiting the sequel to Adventures in Stochastic Processes, more on that to come shortly, my dad has come up with some situational problems for his problem sets to challenge his students and also to keep them interested. Combining his two sides, recently he has turned to his family for problem set humor. I'll share with you two problem sets that involve myself, which again give you a clear look at Sid's two sides and how he utilizes his brilliant statistical mind and his uncontrollable sophomoric inclinations. <laughs> the, the first. My wife and I, who I'm sure is very happy she's not here for this story. <laughs> Met freshman year in the dorms on North Campus in 2001. Got married in 2010, and our daughter was born in 2014. A few weeks after we found out that my wife was pregnant and we were waiting for the test results from the blood work test you take when you're pregnant, our doctor called us and told us that Jacqueline absolutely, definitely, without a doubt, had syphilis. <laughs> now, of course, this turned out to be a false positive result and we were totally fine. At any rate, my dad thought this whole thing was quite amusing, <laughs> saw an opportunity, and now all the undergrads who take his class get to work on a problem set involving the probability of getting a false positive with syphilis. <laughs> yeah, I didn't make that up. Yeah, but it's been anonymized. <laughs> Not anymore. Out of the fact you just outed yourself. Jackie's face is on the cover. The other example, The other example is a problem set about Nasty Nate, a, bar a bartender at Ruloff's who leaves town and leaves Sid and Mena with a lot of beer that may or may not have gone bad since they don't drink beer, and now they don't know which beer to serve at a grad student yes. reception. <laughs> to clarify, I'm Nasty Nate, I worked at Ruloff's. <laughs> <laughs> However, this is obviously a fictitious scenario because I think we all know grad students have very low standards and will drink any kind of beer that's free <laughs> and that's available. <laughs> At any rate, while this is an amusing scenario and gives the students the impression that I'm a raging alcoholic, <laughs> the best part of this problem involves my nickname, which my dad, I'm sure, is clueless as to its origination. What Sid doesn't know is the nickname Nasty Nate was given to me while working at Ruloff's in an extreme sense of irony. In a very popular 1998 comedy movie, the fictional character Nasty Nate is a very large African-American homosexual inmate who continuously antagonizes one of the main characters. So I can only imagine what a lot of students doing this problem set for homework think about myself and the rest of the family. Orange is the new black. So even though my dad is a bit starved for new creative material for his problem sets, as is apparent by these examples, I'm sure the big question on everyone's mind is, will Sid write another book at this point? And if yes, will it be a sequel involving Happy Harry? Will there be a Mary Mary or a late Elizabeth? <laughs> well, a few weeks ago, my dad actually spilled the beans in an exclusive interview with never before seen footage. And yes, there will be a sequel to Happy Harry. Please enjoy this interview where Sid, with his usual eloquence, and sophistication discusses ideas for his new book and the new innovations and stochastic processes that he proffers. Also, I included subtitles since the interviewer has a bit of an accent.
said some rather nice things about uh, Sid, so I thought I'd get up here and, and put an immediate stop to that, but, <laughs> but I think actually Nasty Nate managed that for me. So, so um, David asked if I, if I wanted to uh, say a couple of things, um, and I racked my brain. Um, uh, I was one of Sid's inconsiderate uh, hires, um, but after thinking for a long time, I actually couldn't think of anything to, to say to Sid. Uh, but I did have a couple of questions for Minna. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can I crawl uh, under the table now? No, 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 absolutely not. Um, so so my, my question was really this. So uh, as best I can judge, you're a woman of fine taste. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I would say exceptional visual sensibility. <laughs> and so my, my question is, how is it that you agreed to... Consort with. Blindsided. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the question was really like, so how did you agree to consort with someone with the, the sort of sartorial elegance of, 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 of someone who arrives? So each morning I, I witness Sid arriving at work, um, looking uh, like he's. Um, Traverse the entire length of the Alaska Highway on his bike. <laughs> so, Sid, I, I really—it's—it's it's been a pleasure and an honour and a, a happy birthday. Um, and I would just say I look forward to many more happy hours discussing the relative merits of um, mountain equipment cloth fabrics with you. <laughs> Thank you. So, Maybe Jake, you can help me. That, that there, there's also a, a number of people who uh, send in some video recordings to offer long-distance comments. So we'll, we'll switch to that. Hi, Sid. Uh, this is Trevor. You may remember me from uh, about 15 years ago when I was a student at Cornell. I really appreciated your uh, supervision uh, when I was a TA for you. Uh, I really did appreciate your uh, lectures uh, when I was uh, uh, taking your courses. And uh, um, I definitely appreciated the advice that you gave me, uh, um, especially toward the end of my, uh, my uh, term there. Uh, and of course, best of all, I remember the uh, uh, pickup soccer games that you, uh, um, that, that you uh, came out to play with uh, us uh, graduate students. I think we all really appreciated that. So uh, uh, thank you, Sid, and uh, happy 70th. Hi. Uh, so just after I joined Sid as a PhD student uh, long back, uh, my friend started telling me that it seems I had started emulating Sid, taking his advice beyond classes uh, a little bit too much. I didn't, I didn't see it. Uh, so what? I I started getting all my news from John Stewart, but everyone does that, I think. Uh, at least did that. I mean, not anymore. He is not in TV anymore. I get all my news from that South African guy in Comedy Central now. I I did mention to my mother that it would be nice if she could find me a nice Jewish girl to marry. Well, <laughs> that doesn't say anything. I think Sid never told me this. I mean, he might have suggested something to Krishanu. Uh, but not me, not me. I I know that uh, every Indian mother would like to find uh, her son a nice uh, girl to marry, Jewish or not. Well, uh, we're still waiting. I, 
So I, I did buy a bike in Ithaca and that's what my friends tell me and it seems odd. I, I was not riding the bike too often and everyone in Ithaca had a bike. I did get a bike in Singapore too and uh, every, everyone in Singapore does, does not have a bike. Actually, actually they, they do shout at bikers sometimes on the streets. But, but I didn't know how to go to school otherwise. So I don't think that, that uh, makes us uh, emulating Sid in any way. I, I don't even like Annie Hall. And Sid puts quotes from Annie Hall in his book. Uh, was it heavy? Did it, uh, did it reach total heaviosity? What does that mean? If you really want to mean heavy, uh, put, put a picture of me. Mm, even better, put a picture of Parthenil. Well, I cleared it. I cleared it with Parthenil. Uh, he can't sue me. So, uh, anyway, uh, all jokes apart, uh, thank you, Sid. It was uh, great fun working with you, and uh, thank you for sharing your time with me. Uh, I'm sure uh, it was not easy all the time. Uh, all the best, and uh, have a great time today. Hi, I'm Andy Lurch, and I was a grad student in uh, uh, ORIE back in the 80s. And in fact, I was a grad student when Sid came and gave his job talk at the Tuesday afternoon seminar. And back in those days, there was a, a, an MBA student who showed up every week and for the most part couldn't understand what the heck was being talked about. But he showed up and he had a laptop. And this was in the late 80s. I think it was the first laptop I had ever seen. So it was, God knows how much it cost. But anyway, he would sit there every week. And uh, Sid gave his talk. It was a great talk on extreme values. And, uh, but this, this student asked the same question every week to every single uh, presenter at the Tuesday afternoon seminar. And that was, are there any salient business applications of this methodology? And, of course, most of the speakers that we had on Tuesday afternoon, that wasn't their focus. They were very theoretically oriented. And so they would kind of tap dance around and all this other stuff. Well, when he asked that question to Sid, Sid looked him right in the eye and said, God, I hope not. And I'm sure that, you know, under the circumstances, they probably decided to hire him right there on the spot. Uh, a few few years later, uh, well, maybe... A year later, a year and a half or something, I played on the softball team with Sid. Uh, we had a, a graduate and faculty softball team that played in the summer. And, uh, you know, I told this story to Sid, and he said, oh, my God, did I really say that? And I said, oh, yeah, you did. So anyway, happy birthday, Sid, uh, and uh, many more. And uh, uh, best wishes from here at George Mason. Harry meets Sleeping Beauty. Harry dreams he's Prince Charming coming to rescue Sleeping Beauty from her slumbering imprisonment with a kiss. The situation is more complicated than in the original tale, however, as Sleeping Beauty sleeps in one of three positions. One, flat on her back, in which case she looks truly radiant. Fetal position in which case she looks less than radiant. What does that mean? Fetal position? Yeah. Like a baby? Like a baby. Yeah. Fetal position and sucking her thumb, in which case she looks radiant only to an orthodontist. Sleeping beauty changes of position occur according to a Markov chain when transition matrix. Um, so what does this mean? Now, from the fetal position, he goes to the, sorry, so from flat on her back, he goes to the fetal position 75% of the time, and goes to the fetal position and sucking her thumb 25% of the time. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> and if She's in the fetal position. She goes back to flat on her back 25% of the time. And Does this make sense? 75% of the time she starts sucking her thumb. Mm -hmm. 
slow. Most of the time she just <laughs> types her thumb. Right? Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And guess what happens when she's in the fetal position of sucking her thumb? What? Twenty-five percent of the time she turns flat on her back. And then seventy-five percent of the time she stops sucking her thumb. <laughs> that doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> Okay, well, that's What's the question? Know. Let's ask the question. Let's see if you can answer the question. Now there's a puzzle question. What is the long run percentage of time Sleeping Beauty looks truly radiant? Mm. 25 and a million thousand. Okay. Good answer. Good answer. Is that yeah. it? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> then I get it right. Let's see the answers. There are no answers. I don't know. This book has no answers. <laughs> Say hi. Happy birthday. Boo boo bye. It's no. not a birthday. Well, <laughs> it's close. Happy academic birthday. Happy retirement. Happy retirement. Sid, is it true you're actually going to retire? When I first heard this, I went into shock. In fact, I couldn't even remember my name. So I wrote it on the blackboard behind me, so now I'll always remember my name. It's been fun knowing you. You've had many an interesting conversation over the years at the synagogue, about work, about play. You're a funny guy. Well, you're not funny strange, but, well, maybe you are a little funny strange, but, but you're funny funny. And it's been a pleasure knowing you, and I wish you the very best, and I hope you continue to enjoy many years of happiness and pleasure. Sid, I really wish I could have been there for your roast, but I just have too much work to do here on my sabbatic and I couldn't get away. Thank you for welcoming me and my family to Ithaca. Even though you're now officially really old, I want to encourage you to keep up your position as Lee Weitner in ORIE and not wimp out like you did with soccer. Remember, there's no such thing as bad weather only bad clothing, even when you're seven. So I guess now I have my own chance to uh, add a couple of comments. That, that, I mean, first of all, and, and this is really just building on things that lots of people have touched on over the evening, that you know, Sid is someone from from whom we've all learned. That you know, when I took over the job as uh, being director, there were all kinds of lessons that I I, I needed to take from Sid. Um, one key one was always have a suit jacket tucked away behind a door, so that if someone showed up un unexpectedly or you were called on to the provost's office, the dean's office, you didn't look as completely underdressed as I always do. <laughs> um, the second uh, was really the thing that, and Sid is just fabulous about, using his ability to barb at you to take life a little bit more evenly. And in general, I, I think of life as a, op you know, a series of giving Sid opportunities to, to tease you. <laughs> and, and so, where did I do with it? Ah, oh, there, that's what I did with it. So I thought I'd, I'd actually show you the thing that Sid teases me about the most. <clears throat> so there was this day when I was even more hassled than normal, and I was trying to do too many things. And yes, I left this backpack with this laptop on top of my car <laughs> and drove away. <laughs> The amazing thing is that in spite of that you can see through it, it still works. But the moral that Sid always does in bringing this up is it's take a deep breath, think about life, and just, you know, keep things in perspective. And he's, he's quick to tease me about when I'm feeling just a bit, you know, you can see that edge that I, I don't quite have everything under control. That he says, oh, this is like the time when you left the backpack on top of the car. And it's done with just the right mix of good-naturedness 
that it doesn't have the edge. I mean, come from a different person to come out and stop reminding me. It still works, you know. Um, but but nonetheless, from Sid, it comes out with this feeling of take a deep breath, inhale, and go on to the next thing, and life really will be okay. And in general, this is another big thing about Sid is that, and, and this is a lesson that I I I, I had to I still struggle with. But he, he's very big on the message that there are some things in life that you don't want to get an A in. That really, that sort of figuring out what's important, what isn't important, putting your efforts where it matters, but some things where you want to pass, really let them go. And this sort of having someone to send this message over and over again is really just, there isn't any, any more valuable uh, colleague to have. So, so that was some lessons that I learned from Sid. And one thing, we've talked about bicycling throughout. I mean, this has been a, a, a running theme. That uh, Sid is very proud of his bicycles. In particular, he's proud of his collapsible bike, which is the whiz of you can carry it anywhere and take anywhere. And I, I thought that really he's focusing on the wrong technology. So maybe you all remember, there were, you know, it's a common thing in life, and the kids love playing with, and the kids in the audience can have the leftovers. There, there are these little capsules that you can put into warm water, and they'll expand. And like Julia Child, I already put some in the oven so I can take them out. <laughs> so, so you know, you can know you have here a little lion. Oops. A lion that grew out of this. And, you know, so, so the message is that forget about this collapsing business. Wouldn't it be better if you had some way of taking a small bike and making it bigger? And then you wouldn't have to even fold it. <laughs> so I've been working on this for quite some time. And I've only gotten half of the solution. And I've gotten the small bike. <laughs> but I haven't figured out how to get it bigger. <laughs> Is it hers? Is it hers, yes. <laughs> so, and I also, <laughs> everyone has always commented on how much patience it takes to be Sid's wife. Now, really, we should have just had a bouquet of patience rather than, <laughs> <laughs> but we had a more varied bouquet instead, so. <laughs> now, as Nathan alluded to, there was one grant that was, that Sid wanted, he said, I don't want something for my retirement. I'm not retiring yet, you know. I want something for myself. I really <laughs> want it to be a roast, and I get the last word. He's the last word. He's but before notes. you get the last word, <laughs> I think it's time for a toast. Again? Yeah. To sit. The <laughs> guy. Before I close this. The floor is yours. God help us. <laughs> you realize he's been taking notes. I do know. I do know. With his co Cornello or I pen, no less. And my borrowed memo. Pen. I don't. I don't actually have a lot to say because I was pretty tame shit. <laughs> uh, Mark, you really ought to learn to cook something else. <laughs> this one trick wonder business, you know, it's wearing thin. Um, Kevin Wayne, yeah, he forgot to tell you a few things. Um, Kevin was extraordinarily fast, and, uh, you know, I took up soccer rather late, so I was never very skilled, and... Uh, I played defense, but Kevin played fullback, usually behind everybody. And he was the guy who would clean up the messes you made by making mistakes. 
So I think, I think the most used phrase in soccer when I was playing was, Kev, pick up! <laughs> because somebody had gotten past me and, uh, or I was out of position or something. Uh, Kathy, Kathy, Kathy. I do remember bo uh, my office being bombed yearly. Jack Muckstead collaborated on that, although nobody would admit to this. I also, she forgot to tell you about all the tissues I handed out to her in my office when she was in tears for this or that. She was so emotionally fragile, it was really, I, mean, <laughs> I, I don't know actually how she went on to, you know, her current responsibilities. <laughs> um, how, how she was able to handle so many things. Victoria, uh, I'm not sure Victoria remembered everything quite right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was, tr I was re recruiting her, and I was pretty sure that this shy retiring flower from New York City didn't really want to leave home. So I had to figure out some way that she could, you know, imagine life not in New York City, you know, at least for four or five years. So, uh, you know, the, when, you're, when you're DGS or GFR, you, you try and do whatever you can do. You feel like you're representing the whole department. So I uh, found this bus schedule in the Cornell Daily Sun. I sent it to her, and you never know what's going to have an impact on people. I mean, it's apparently still with her mother, this <laughs> yellowing piece of paper on a non-existent schedule now. Richard Davis. I never worry when he gets up to speak, because I know nobody can hear him anyway. <laughs> um, he reminds me, you know that character in Pitch Perfect, the... Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it's the other one, the, 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 silent one. the silent one that she opens her mouth up and everybody's going like this, no sound ever comes out, so, that ain't me. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, Richard, Richard left something out also, uh, one of the famous things was the story of the Burger King proof, uh, we were in the middle of something and we went off to Burger King for one of our typical high class lunches, <laughs> Richard later went on to uh, improve his gastronomic intake. He switched to McDonald's. I think. <laughs> uh, but I, I, he, he was wearing a shirt for some reason, which had the sleeve torn. You know, LeBron James later made this famous. But uh, I think the story was that we were waiting to see which would collapse first, the proof or his T-shirt. <laughs> Franz, that's the most work I've ever seen you do for anything. <laughs> Mike Todd, um, I don't worry about anything he says either because nobody can understand a British accent. <laughs> they just assume you're playing the euphonium or whatever it is. <laughs> you know, blowing, blowing hot air or, or water around the room. And then there's Shane. I never worry about anything he says either because nobody can understand somebody from Australia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nobody can understand an Aussie accent. Uh, let's see. Oh, proving theorems. He didn't explain that properly. I was quoting him <laughs> when I said he can't prove anything. And that's just a direct quote from him. Uh, the kick-ass bike light, you're probably all wondering what happened to it. It just died one day. This is the light that was, I think, 30 watts, and the battery fit inside your water bottle cage. Um, it was uh, something that kept me alive for about 10 years. Uh, Nathan? I'm just speechless. <laughs> uh, first time in my life. I'm just, I mean, for, for a guy who doesn't talk much, that was pretty damn good. <laughs> um, Adrian, yes, uh, MEC, yes, we, we've had our discussions about that, but I don't worry about anything Adrian says. Nobody can understand that accent either. <laughs> uh, Happy Harry has come up many times. Um, you know what the most important thing of my professional career, uh, the, sorry, the most embarrassing thing of my professional career 
people refer to me as the father of Happy Harry. <laughs> uh, people wonder where he came from, and I honestly have no good answer for that. Just, I was trying to create problems one day, and this just came bubbling up with all the other madness, so uh, I don't really know. Um, I've discovered, as I've gotten older, that people have different attitudes about retirement and aging, and they have different expectations. And like a lot of things, there are a lot of stereotypes associated with it. So we'll, we'll just have to see which ones are uh, true and which ones are not so true as uh, the years develop. David, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you over the years uh, and seeing you kind of grow. Uh, one thing you said reminded me of something a uh, former colleague said, uh, Peter, I meant uh, that. <laughs> 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 Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was uh, six foot when I started that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, this, this thing about you don't have to get an A plus and everything. Uh, the, the quote is from Peter Brockwell, who uh, uh, Richard and I worked with in Colorado and uh, retired now is back in Melbourne. But uh, his, his comment was, a job not worth doing was not worth doing well. <laughs> and uh, it, it is important to know uh, when to pull out the stops. But uh, I think most people don't have your stamina and drive and energy and probably don't push things as hard as you do. But I think it's also clear that everybody uh, agrees that, that you're doing a great job and that you really make things happen and you know when when something needs to be changed and improved that, that you really work at it and accomplish a great deal so, uh, it's been a pleasure thanks very much for organizing this I appreciate it thanks to all of you uh, to the young people uh, some of you who are uh, you know have come recently this is a special place uh, Ithaca is a great place to live, but the people are very unusual. Uh, they actually like each other, which is unusual in a department. And uh, keep it going, pay it forward. It's, uh, it's been really nice to be here, and it's nice to see the place developing and how it will develop into the future. So thanks very much, everyone.